Here's a reflection on my first four weeks of education at the Watch Technology Institute, also known as WTI. My class is 14 students. The youngest is 19 and the oldest is 67. Uh, that would be me. Monday through Thursday have nine hours of classroom and Friday is a half day. There's usually about one hour, maybe two hours of theory homework each week. But many students, me included, stay after class to do extra lab work so we'll finish our current projects on time or redo a previous project to improve our grade. This past month has been mostly freehand manufacturing. Our projects require us to use one or more of the following. A vise clamped to our workbench, hacksaws and jeweler saws, metal files in coarseness grades two, four, and six, and maybe with a couple of other grades depending upon the need, a black Sharpie marker, a carpenter square, sandpaper of varying grits, and our calipers. Some projects require additional tools such as sharpening stones or a drill press or a depth gauge. Now we don't have jigs for filing parallel or perpendicular to the material that we're working on. And we don't use a lathe or any other powered cutter or sander. We have to complete our projects entirely by hand and boy has this been an education. I'll tell you about our very first exercise at the very end of this video. Our second exercise was to produce four rods from a piece of brass rod stock. Their lengths had to be within a specified tolerance and the ends had to be filed flat and smooth. The third exercise was to cut down steel rods and create uh, four flat surfaces on them at right angles. These should look familiar to you if you're a watchmaker. They are in fact the larger than life sections of a watch's winding stem, which I guess we're going to eventually make uh, sometime during the year. I've never been a mechanical shop class person. So using these tools has been a learning curve for me. It's been fun, but also demanding because each project has a due date. And if you're not done on time, well, that is, as they say, not good. Each project is graded. And if your grade sucks, that's also not good. You get to do it all over and you better get a better grade on the second attempt. Generally speaking, uh, it may be no surprise that having to do a project twice is, shall we say, not good. The key thing, though, is to always be improving uh, and getting better at the manufacturing work. And I am, but I wish I could improve my skills more quickly than I am. Uh, anyway, after all that, we had an introduction to metals um, and their properties, and in particular, different types of steel and steel's properties and how to heat treat steel. And we then made a hardened and tempered scribe in class. I've never um, appreciated the ways that steel is basically a miracle material. You know, you, you have steel and then you use temperature and cooling to change its properties. You can dial in the hardness and toughness that you need. Um, and then if you change your mind or you overshoot, you can reset it and redo it uh, all over again with no loss um, if you have to do that. And that's really very, very cool. <laughs> uh, after the scribe, we're now working on the current project, which is a Horia tool bit holder. We're manufacturing it out of a brass block. Uh, as with the other projects, there are required dimensions and tolerances, and we have to bevel edges and finish the surface. Um, this introduced us to a vernier-based depth gauge that allowed us to scribe the block, and we're using center punches, or we used center punches, to mark where our holes are to be drilled. Two of my holes are way out of tolerance. Um, I goofed up when I positioned the drill bit on the block but I can't turn back now because I'm halfway into the project and it's not a short project. Um, if my grade is too low, we're graded on different aspects of it and I'm gonna get marked off for the holes that I screwed up, but hopefully I'll get better grades on other aspects of it. But um, if my grade is too low, I will need to redo this uh, in order to uh, get an improved grade on it. 
Uh, in any event, um, through this all, I've learned how to control a drill press, um, at least better than I used to be able to, um, and position the bit on the material uh, much better than how I was doing it when I started. In between all of this, we've disassembled, lubed, and reassembled an ETA 6497 and a Bulova FE140C movement. Oh, and we're lubricating capsules with a regular oiler <laughs> and not using Bergeon automatic oilers, which is disappointing because I really like the automatic oilers. We've learned the right way, the meticulous way, to dress our screwdrivers and tweezers. And we have to do this before starting work on any movement. And the screwdriver dressing was especially eye-opening for me. Now, I've used Dia Sharp pads in my home study and in my home workbench, I, and I use them dry. I eyeball the screwdriver's faces and tips, and, you know, that was good enough for what I was doing at the time. Well, the screwdriver dressing done at WTI is a couple of orders of magnitude more exacting. We dressed our screwdrivers, uh, as I said, before starting on a movement, and that's not just to correct defects like a bent corner on a face, but also to comport the screwdrivers to this movement's screws. Are the slots in the screws, you know, short and wide, or are they deep and narrow? Well, you want the screwdriver to tips to fit exactly for the best possible grip. And that's the goal, to match them, to match the tips and faces to the screws as precisely as you can for the best possible screwdriver performance. That's my clock dinging off. We use Arkansas and India stones and what the school calls stone juice, which is a 50-50 mixture of kerosene and mineral oil. I've discovered that, like most other human endeavors, uh, sharpening has an infinite number of rabbit holes. You can get into sharpening or any of its subtopics as deeply as you want. If you do any searching, you'll find online communities devoted to discussing sharpening and the tools for sharpening and how to use certain stones and the right way to hold it and the angle and this and that and the lubricants to use with sharpening. There's a whole world out there. Uh, as to how I'm feeling about all this, honestly, it's a mixed bag. Um, I love the program and my class, and I enjoy what I'm learning, um, and I'm learning a lot, and that's all great. Um, but there are aspects that are less than great. I can't say it's fun to wake up at 5.15 every morning and to have a one hour or you know, really 50 minute commute to and from class. Although admittedly the commute is partly on me because uh, I'm using mass transit, I'm not driving, and, but it's 50 minutes each way. And I'm struggling to improve my manufacturing skills um, and my project performance so far hasn't been great. I mean, actually one of my projects really sucked. Having to do projects twice is twice the amount of work. And I'm trying to not get stressed out about this. I keep reminding myself that I'm only one month into the program but then I see how quickly the other students are producing quality work, and a couple of them are incredibly um, uh, talented in the design department, and there are a couple that are just using hand tools as like second nature to them, uh, and they do great work, and their stuff looks wonderful. And then I get kind of annoyed with myself. Uh, I'm going in tomorrow to work three or four hours on the Horia Bit project so that I make sure that I'm at least on par with where most of the rest of my class is on it. Now, I want to show you our very first class project. We started with square aluminum stock. We then used a hacksaw to rip it in half to make a nameplate for our workbench. And this was basically, I think, a Trojan horse to um, learn our body's biases. When you file, you naturally tend to tilt the file either upward or downward, leftward or rightward. And this stems from how your joints are constructed and how everything is connected and how your muscles are working and which muscles are slightly stronger than the other. So you think that you're filing a surface nice and flat, but if you don't watch yourself, in reality, you're doing anything but. Uh, you have to compensate for your body's biases. Uh, and this is easier said than done, but it's doable. We used our vise, files, squares, calipers, and jeweler saws, but that's it. There were no jigs to position the tools, no power tools. We had to design our, our nameplate, design what our name looked like, just pick a font or freehand it. I mean, do we use block letters? Do we want, you know, script? I mean, and then whatever we um, uh, decided on, we had to 
uh, transpose that design onto the aluminum, trace it out, and then cut in, and then start to file it out. Some of the students produced stunning work. Uh, well, actually, all of them produced stunning work, <laughs> except me. My nameplate was rather plain. Uh, I don't feel too bad about this because, as this was the very first project, uh, the instructor said that we weren't being graded on how it looked. Good for me. Uh, if we got it done, then that was sufficient to get a completed grade on the project. So here we go. So here's the classroom. This is Gavin's nameplate. Wonderfully done. Nice finish on the outside. Look at that. Mm. Foches, I love the big O. A nice finishing. Here's my crappy plate. The only claim to fame I have is the ellipsis. I haven't finished, fin I have to finish the outside and do beveling and clean up some of the inside, so I'm not done with it, but still. Not very good, but hey, I got it done. Wills is great. He has nice beveling on the letters and he put some red stuff behind it and I think he's gonna add some stuff here. Anna is wonderful, super creative, super talented. And her name, she can flip it over. <laughs> look at that. And look on the work on the, on the little, the little uh, lines here, the curved lines. Beautifully done. Ryan did his in a Star Trek font, and I think it came out great. You look at it, and I immediately think of Star Trek. Very cool. Diego, I think he wanted his D to be differently, different initially, but he put this stuff, this backing that glows under uh, black light, and it looks really slick. Very nice, stylized. I think he's going to add a switch to it to put a light back there so he can make it glow on demand. Caleb, all those curves, man, and they're so clean. And he finished the front of it, too. Really nice. This is Dylan's. His nickname is Dill, uh, and... Uh, he filled up the entire plate and then he did like a sandblasting finish on it. I don't know if you can see that in the video. As you can see, all, everyone's nameplate is better than, better than mine. Peter is stunningly creative. Look at this. Not only, I mean, it's, it's, it's three dimensional and he made the letters different sizes so they pop out. This guy has got creativity galore, and he's super talented with the tools. Uh, whoops, Jacobs. Jacob doesn't have his name played out. I don't know why. Tuesday. Look at those curves. She hasn't finished hers yet. She's still working on it. She's got to, I guess, finish the inside edges. Looks like she already did some finishing of the outside, though. The U actually has an umlaut over it, and I've been, I told her she ought to do the umlaut, it would just take a drill press, but I don't know if she's gonna do it. I think Leo has the shortest name in the class. We were all envious of that because he had the least amount of letters to actually have to do. Did some kind of oh look at that two different finishes he's got hammered on the back and he has like a I don't know what it is a sandblasting kind of thing on the front I don't know if he's planning to put a backing on it or not and then last one is Austin's he did the four um, circles at the corners he went with a serif font. Holy crap, I didn't do that. I deliberately stayed away from serif fonts, but he did a serif font. Look at the curves on the E, the finishing. 
And um, the O, what Greek symbol is that? That's not, um, that's not theta. I have to look that up. I think that's a, that's a Greek symbol, right? Gort, som findes i studielommen, og studerer informationen om, hvordan nødgangen åbnes. At håndbagage og overtøj skal I placere i bagagehylden. We are now preparing for departure. Anyway, beautiful. This is where we did our metal tempering. And just to review, we come back to my meek and simplistic nameplate. So I'm going to finish the insides of the letters, then I'm going to bevel them, and then I'm going to do some kind of sandblasting or something on the outside, and that's it. I, you know, maybe I'll put a backing on it, red or green or something, to make the letters pop. I like the O being a big uh, circle, just like Foch has on his. But he was smarter, though. He made his O really big, and it really stands out. Mine is just, well, it's smaller. But at least I made it darn near circular, which for me was an achievement. The ellipses were done with uh, a drill press. So that's my nameplate. And that's our class's nameplates. And that's all I have for you today. Till next time, take care.